Thank you for coming for coming in tonight. Um, we have the October meeting of CDI, and um, I want to welcome Sanjeev, who is presenting here to us, and also our remote speaker um, Nirvik, who is going to present remotely. Um, just the housekeeping. Um, so, if you want to get announcements about this FCDI, please um, register or sign up on our website. And um, all the online attendees, they are muted. If you have any questions, please use the chat panel. Um, Nirvik Saha, he's a, a PhD student at Georgia Tech. He's going to present second after Sanjeev. And he's going to present his research in uh, machine learning and um, space planning. Sanjeev is a principal and um, firm wide director of um, enclosure systems uh, at Walter P. Moore. And he's going to present emerging technologies at um, a new uh, ways of fabrication and um, design of complex facades tonight for us. Um, I also want to thank you as sponsors, AIA, SF, BeamTrack, and Gensler for providing, um, allowing us to just have the um, continuation of our presentations every month. Um, I would just hand, the, hand over the presentation to Sanjeev. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, really happy to be here. It's a hell of a turnout. Um, I gave this presentation uh, a few months ago at Facade Tectonics in Seattle, um, and uh, I think one of your colleagues uh, recommended uh, that I come and present to SF, uh, to SFCDI. Um, it's about how we work and sort of the dialogue we have as, as we work on complex facade systems and how my team works uh, in terms of approaching design, uh, data, modeling, and how we sort of uh, communicate that to fabricators and constructors. We find a lot these days uh, uh, there is uh, more and more dialogue between the design team and the construction team uh, through digital models. And so we try and uh, ourselves uh, control how that dialogue is held because uh, especially for, for complex systems, there's a very fine line between success and failure. Um, it can lead to uh, massive losses or great projects with great profits. So um, a lot of the dialogue is really about the data management. Um, so it's really about you know what programs we use, what software you, we use, and what are the different systems uh, that we use for collaboration. Um, 15 second plug on Walter P. Moore. Uh, we are a national firm. Uh, in Houston, uh, we are uh, we have four different uh, practice areas: structural engineering, infrastructure, diagnostics, and technology. Uh, the facades and closure practice sits in the structural engineering practice, so you can kind of see there on the, that that list on the top left. So structures and closure practice, parking secure design, and construction engineering. Um, we have about 16 offices in North America and a couple of offices in Canada, one in India and one in Panama. So, but primarily based uh, in North America. Uh, the overall firm is about 650 people, of, of which about 350 are on the structural engineering uh, practice. So, these are some of the uh, projects that I've been working on, that my team has been working on in the last five years. Uh, our enclosure practice started within Walter P. Moore about in 2014. That's when I joined. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to get some really interesting projects, some of which you may recognize, and uh, some of which we'll talk about uh, through the presentation today. Uh, the third row, second one down is, of course, the Warriors. Uh, I'll discuss that a little bit. So, um, design tools that we sort of, uh, the first part of the presentation is just sort of this dialogue between different software and how we approach it. So uh, within, within our group, we started sort of the digital practice side of uh, primarily around documentation, how most of the design work was being done in Rhino and sort of clients would come to us and say, hey, you know, Revit's are really sort of our, our, uh, our uh, documentation software. Can we get the, interop the interoperability going? Um, especially for these big 
big project. So that was good uh, in really coordination, doing drawings, uh, doing schedules. It is an information rich model, not as accurate as the Rhino side, uh, whereas Rhino is really used for design, uh, iterations, and optioneering. And in, in our turn, we've actually started using it for fabrication modeling as well. So uh, what does inter interoperability do? It allows the project to, can to capture the strengths of different software um, and sort of avoid the weaknesses. We say we are software agnostic for the most part, find the right tool for the right job. Uh, and if we can find it, we'll find a way to make sure that the data is uh, sort of tra transferable from project to, from project. To project. Um, what that allows us to do is also maintain uh, consistency of data, sort of trying to find one platform which, which you can exchange data in, um, and it develops the agnostic format. So diagrammatically, this was where we started, Revit to Rhino, trying to find a link. Um, as we started getting into additional sort of uh, pieces of the puzzle in terms of construction, there's Tecla, which is the fabrication software, they sat out uh, SAP 2000, which is the analysis software. So you start sort of getting uh, sort of multiple uh, connections. And as you get into larger projects with more sort of with more software uh, pro programs, you start getting into this sort of mess of trying to exchange data between models. So within Walter Moore, we've sort of created something called the SID, which is essentially a central information database, which is based around an Excel file to CSV format which extracts data from one software and, and uh, it basically can be input into, in, into another software. So that's what it looks like. Um, as the project develops and you start sort of uh, making the model more and more complex, the, the data file keeps growing. So it starts with the simple geometry of the point or line uh, and the definition of that in space, but then it starts adding uh, sort of, uh, it's, it starts adding uh, member sizes, reaction forces, orientation, et cetera. So. Uh, this is one project, I won't go into this project, but it's a simple example in terms of diagrammatic where we basically have the Rhino Grasshopper model wireframe uh, that was developed through the design services that was transferred into SAP for, for analysis and was transferred into Tecla directly for fabrication of the steel as well as Revit for the documentation of the project. You can see the components of the project. It was a large sort of uh, it was a large practice facility for an NFL team out in Jacksonville. You can see the layers of the different components and the uh, four software that we use on on the design stages. And the success of the project is one quick picture of what it looks like today. So um, what's the little blue thing in there? Anyway? Little hidden word. Watermark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not on my thing. Okay. Ooh, all right. So in terms of data management, uh, the way to, to explain things is uh, the simplest form of data is a point, um, and how a point is used is essentially a work point on the on the surface. Uh, we had a project in 2014 when Dynamo was just sort of coming online. Uh, we specifically said, all right, you know, we'll transfer what we were doing in Grasshopper and Rhino into Revit and try and try and try and use Dynamo. So I mean, our group that was sort of beta beta version of Dynamo at that point, uh, and we started basically with a with a very simple basis of you know using Excel file to transfer the points from from uh, from from uh, Rhino into into Revit. That eventually made it as the data point set. Into the, into the documentation set. So this was one of the code facades as a code group. Um, and we basically created a series of work points which were developed from, from that model, gave every work point a location and a tag, and essentially also documented it in 2D because that was the requirement for the airport to actually uh, provide 2D documents. But we also handed over uh, an Excel file. Uh, what, what the data point is, is basically how it relates back into the project and, and, and to the details. It is pointed out and located on the actual detail. So you have work point one, work point two, work point one is for the face of glass, work point two is the face of steel. You have, you, you have an offset, you provide the data file for that point to the contractors. 
um, and they get it. Uh, it was pretty successful. Uh, everybody sort of, you know, and 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 uh, sort of everyone understands this process fairly well now. And uh, that's what the project looked like a couple of months ago. Uh, it's fairly linear. Uh, simple data work point sort of was was good enough to uh, to document in this case. Taking it out to the next level where you have lines and arcs, uh, you basically have three work points to find an arc. This is a project in Minnesota. Uh, the, it's a soccer stadium for the Minnesota United uh, Soccer Club. Uh, essentially, the entire stadium is, is uh, clad with this fabric membrane, which have these hoops. Uh, that same sort of Rhino data set was also transferred into the, into the uh, analysis software which we could run a complete analysis. There are no expansion joints on this. So you can kind of see where the, where the stresses are and, uh, during temperature swings in Minnesota. We also added the additional piece of uh, the, the membrane software, which basically was using the same set of data points <coughs> to create the services and run analysis. And then we output that, that, uh, that, that analysis in terms of a, a, a visual map for the architect. So he could see uh, where he needed to change the geometry. Um, so, so, so in this case, this was an iterative process of about like maybe a couple of weeks, where we were going back and forth on sort of changing the hoop dimensions and the locations in order to keep the widths of the fabric, so that we could eliminate all the red hot spots. So it was a pretty effective, uh, effective process. To so the so the blue is the final location, reds red blue is where we started with. That same uh, that same data set is now used to essentially uh, document in Revit. Uh, you hang the shapes. Uh, that's used for documentation in two dimensional of the typical details and the sections. And then you see we actually handed over the geometry uh, and created a techno model for, for the fabricator as well. Uh, tremendously successful process, basically using the same geometry that we developed in design hand it over to Tecla um, and give it to the fabricator. Mm -hmm. There were on the hoops, there were no RFIs um, and everything fit. So it was it was quite a, a big success story on, on, on the process. That's what it looks like. Um, I'm taking it to the next level up. Um, simple surfaces from, from arcs. Uh, this is really a two-dimensional surface, simple curves. Uh, so the same project that I showed first with the data set, the roof was actually a sphere. Uh, and we actually used the roof's spherical surface and sort of noted all the structural top of columns uh, that were digitally transferred to, to the fabricator. Uh, and that was a digital model for, so both the structural model as well as the facade model was basically using the same set of, set of, set of data. On the facade side, uh, we created uh, basically uh, adaptive components for the various curtain wall panels. Essentially the uh, little uh, pointer here. So there were, there were six different types of panels. Each panel had different components to it where you could mix and match and change the materiality. Um, so the process for the architect was essentially uh, having the ability to um, to change materials based on eventual pricing, uh, sort of changing from glass to metal panel to port panel to to uh, number of sunshades, instead of going through that iterative process to arrive at the at, at the final design that is aligned with the final budget. Um, you can see those four data points are the same as we showed in the in the first uh, in the first panel. So using the work points to create the adaptive component as well, and uh, that was the enclosure model. Uh, so our team, much like how the MEP guys or the structural guys created a Revit model, the enclosure team actually <laughs> created the, the skin model uh, for, for the project. And that's, that's the project right now. It's supposed to be opening in December. Um, the last sort of step to that is uh, complex curved surfaces. Um, taking surface geometry from from Rhino, adding structural structural components that su that supported and uh, creating uh, analysis models is 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 essentially the process. Uh, that's a design model that comes from the architectural team, uh, and we kind of rationalize it, analyze it based on fabrication 
uh, fabrication specific sizes. This is a 30 by 8 panel in this case. Cleaning of the surfaces in terms of geometry. Um, we do this a lot for fabricators as well, but essentially using the same surface geometry. Uh, and all this work is done in Rhino. Um, taking that and re re recreating the surface so that it can be uh, uh, inserted into a Revit model. Um, and, and that panel basically has enough information in the Revit model uh, to be able to get data out of it, cleaning up the panels, and then basically tagging all the panels in Revit uh, as well as Rhino, and then having that data available as a mass family. Once, once you have that in the Revit model, you can actually start cutting sections and doing, doing detailed drawings. Um, this is an inch and a half scale. I think somebody said, uh, can models be used to generate details? Yes, they can, but as, as a backup, um, especially with complex geometry, it's really difficult to draw 2D details of 3D really complex systems. In this case, uh, we were actually able to do it and sort of get the relationships going of the primary structure, the secondary steel framing, and the actual section of the, of the FRP. So, full, this is the FRP process. Uh, you make the mold. Uh, so those surfaces that we create are, are, are the same surfaces that you give to the fabricator to create the mold. Five axis machine, they, they mill out form uh, upside down and then they start laying out the resin, and put the back of the structure on. And that's one of the visual mockups. So um, I'll end with this one. Uh, this is uh, Warriors Arena. We've been working on this project for five years. It's, it's down the road. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, uh, seen it uh, under construction. We'll probably go to a game soon. Um, this this project started as a SketchUp model uh, from Manica. Manica uh, Architecture from Kansas City is the design architect. Kendall Heaton uh, from uh, Houston um, is the executive architect. And they basically got us on board to basically help them through the process of documentation. Uh, that's that's where it started. Hey, hey, I mean, I mean, they said, hey, can you take Monica's model, convert it into Revit, and uh, give us a model to document? But we actually ended up doing a lot more um, than just helping them with with the Revit model. One of the exercises was to essentially uh, work with the with the general contractor because a lot of early pricing is done with square footages. You've got 200,000 square foot, 200 bucks a square foot. Here's 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 the budget. Let's go ahead and VE. Right. Um, so we said, well, we have the power of data, and so sort of looking at you know what the form is with the architect, uh, what the square footages are of each form, um, is a fairly powerful uh, powerful tool to have because this is sort of the conversation going on in the room saying, here's your surface. It's way too expensive. This is what we have budget to build. Um, you know, what can we do, right? So essentially that process gives you the final design to say, yes, you can get a design, but you know, and you arrive at something that's fairly close with a couple of modifications. So brick, brick number surface. This, this, this process took about four months. Uh, a lot of arguing, a lot of uh, arguing about surface numbers, but uh, the power of sort of modeling to help us through it, help, help, help the design team through it. You can kind of see, you know, where that conversation was going and I mean, in terms of, you know, percentage increase in, in, in area. And there's an Excel sheet that kind of uh, tracks the data and the pricing of every component um, based, based, on this, based on this process. Uh, what the actual system is, is, is essentially, you know, it's a, it's, it's a cavity wall. So what, what, we, what we did was essentially take the weather barrier off of the main primary wall and push it back to the drum. So we did actually build a drum in terms of the weather wall system, which is, which is the blue line, because the arena is essentially a black box and it's, and it's circular. So they have columns at 30 feet on center and we wrapped uh, basically studs spanning from floor to floor and wrap the skin right, like, like right about there. But the design surface for the skin is actually out here, and it varies to about 10 to 12 feet max. So that was very successful. The, the other thing that we did was 
we added hoops and large mega panels. So these are uh, eight feet wide by 24 feet tall, or uh, basically modules of three feet each, um, both for the metal panel system as well as for the glazing system and hung it off a secondary structure. Right? Um, the advantage of that is basically it's quick construction. It's all shop, shop, shop fabricated panels, but you also start sort of looking at you know how you can define this complex geometry in terms of uh, geometrical data, because now you essentially are reducing multiple work points of each panel really down to four points, which are 20 feet apart or 21 feet apart or 24 feet feet apart, and then you're basically removing sort of the complexity of of that that element and really pointing it out to three or four different work points on the overall structure. So, so the coordination of this really complex facade becomes fairly simple. Uh, and I'll show you some documentation around that. So how that system works is the primary columns are all in white. We added hoops at, tw at 20 feet on center or 24 feet on center, depending on the finalization. Added these triangular brackets that uh, both pick up dead load as well as transfer uh, that dead load back into the primary columns as well as bracing for lateral. And then you had intermediate hoops, which only picked up dead load and they were hung with rods. So these three levels of 2020 were, were basically picked up over there. And these four levels were picked up at that, at that level in terms of dead loading. So you're dead loading the primary structure back here and back there. And these are purely for lateral, basically based on the size of the mega panel. And then the mega panel is divided up into small, into smaller, Panels. So the idea of sort of breaking down a real complex surface into sort of the simplest eight by three panel and trying to sort of work backwards um, and basically componentize, if that's a word, um, into really simple, understandable components. So that's the final Revit model of, of all the components. So all these surfaces are complex surfaces. The nice part about the eight by three unit was between, based on the warpage of the surface, which is a vertical line here and a, and a slope line over there, you could deal with uh, you could deal easily with the uh, with the warpage within the joint of that panel. So that was the reason to go with the eight by three horizontal panel, both both for this as well as that glass and metal panel. So this sort of the Rhino workflow. Uh, I won't get into it too much, but uh, you can kind of see uh, modeling all the columns and sort of working backwards between the surface and the columns to work out the structure. That's what that looks like. And then starting to panelize uh, within within that, within there. So you have a series of models. You, you essentially have um, the secondary structural model. You have the panelization model. You have the rod model. And all of those uh, have to be documented. So at this point, um, nobody wanted to talk about a model uh, in terms of handing over that to the contractor. They said you need to document the geometry on paper. So we looked at it and said, all right, we'll document it in two different ways. One is try and document the actual surfaces um, of, of the various layers of the skin, and then try and define how the surfaces are, are divided up within this panelization. So there's sort of a small scale and a, and a large scale panelization. So surfaces are essentially defined uh, with, with central work points, what each geometry of that surface is and what it's cut from. It's cut from two different ellipses and sort of work points on what that cut looks like in terms of what that surface actually is. So you have that. And then there were a series of sheets that defined each surface on the entire building. There, there, there were about 30 or 40 different different surfaces. You define the surface, you define, you define the work points, where those ellipses are generated from. It's kind of a <laughs> series of uh, processes that the contractor would have to go to to try and recreate this, this geometry. Uh, very logical, uh, but extremely difficult and prone to mistakes because there is so much information there. It's all numbers. Um, it's very easy. And, and, and we did try, we actually a couple of people okay you have these drawings go back and see if you can remodel this from this data because that's that's the proof of proof of the pudding um and it took them actually a couple of times before they got it right i mean it wasn't that that easy 
Was your coordinate system actually kind of radio like that? You had this sort of center point that everything is referenced off of, or? Yeah, there was there was the basic zero 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 for the entire project, and we used the same one for both that was being used for structural as 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 well as the facade system. So when you measure things as x y from that point, or is it all about like angle and distance from the center point? The problem was that every it's not just an x y z because you have to create the ellipse at the right angle. Um, as soon as that plane shifts, if it, even if it shifts a little bit, you're 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 out of whack because the surface is off. So that's where we found most of the mistakes being made that they couldn't get the actual angle of the plane uh, because it's easy to put a point in space, but when you start actually modeling it and twisting the angles, it starts getting really, really uh, squirrely. So, but yeah, I mean, do, I mean, it's easy to find this point, but to actually generate both those two accurately and get the right plane because they're not in the same plane. They're, they're all in, 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 in different planes. And they're not circles, they're ellipses. So it's like, it makes this sort of one more level of complexity. So, uh, and then that model was of course used to, to cut sections. Um, so this was the other part of, part of the documentation where we said, all right, you know, we'll, we'll at least document the secondary structure where like where the work points are so they can get the back structure. They can basically, uh, because we had to submit reactions for all these points for, for coordination. So there was a second level. The entire building was divided up into four into four quadrants. So we had four of these 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 type of sheets, and then each sheet for the atrium to sort of really talk about the structure and where uh, where the secondary systems were. And so taking it to the next level, trying to sort of define what those what those components were. Um, and Close got the project. For those of you who are not familiar, Close is a big national uh, firm, uh, curtain wall company, fairly uh, fairly uh, decent at uh, digital modeling. Uh, they have a pretty good group. Uh, they came back and said, "There's no way we're going to take these drawings and build this thing. We want the model." Uh, more than the surface model, they said we want the panelization model because. Even if they did manage to create the surface, they never get the panelization right to where, because the panelization took months and months to, to figure out the exact line that the architectural team was, was, was really happy with. Um, so we had to go back to the owners and say, you need to pay the design team to do the model for the fabrication. And uh, the nice part about sort of the story is that while we were developing all of this, we already had that data. So it wasn't like it was starting from scratch. Uh, I mean, you. You said, I mean, we knew that the fabricator is going to ask, ask for this model, even if, if I mean, if it wasn't really a, a contracted document. A um, couple of shots of uh, the panelized, of, of the panels themselves, we went through a number of iterations. Um, eight inch aluminum panels, these are bird wires. Uh, I don't think they're going to stop any birds from going in. <laughs> uh, but you have, you have to do it. Um, the photographs, if you haven't been there, uh, fairly successful. I mean, I think in terms of uh, the process and the ability to transfer that model. Um, again, there were almost no RFIs on the geometry. Um, it was a very, very clean, clean process. Uh, that sort of says that if you have a really clean model with good high, high, high fidelity data, you know, it's 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 going to be really, really useful for construction. Uh, we also worked on the two uh, office buildings by Falong. That's a different story, different day. Eye candy shots. Um, I'm going to end with one really small project. Um, and this is just to sort of to make my point where things are changing. The young, the young designers and architects are thinking differently. Um, these are two young UCLA guys who formed their own company. Um, they had done this as a research project while they were at UCLA grad school, uh, basically using fabric forms to create uh, <coughs> concrete sort of uh, this sort of this. They call it a shading structure. Um, so they submitted a proposal after they'd done this uh, once they finished school to the Amazon conference and in Palm Springs. And lo and behold, they got approved. Uh, they said, yeah, go ahead and build this pavilion. And they came to us saying, oh shit, we got to now <laughs> actually build a structure. So the process is essentially they're working off models. They don't, they don't work off drawings. 
Um, it's direct model to model process and fabrication is a robotic fabrication process. So um, they gave us this model, which is essentially uh, you know, something that, that, that they created and we started adding components to it. We use the same surface model uh, to do our analysis. And, and and essentially mimic what like like uh, what they had done, added uh, added all the various sort of connection pieces, and the point being essentially the first design model that they gave to us was really the model, and our job as engineers was to make sure that we can kind of validate that shape, and help them essentially engineer these connections and help them engineer the actual wires to make sure that uh, you know they have the right thicknesses. And then they went back and created the phone work out of uh, AC. So essentially each, each Y was, was, uh, was created with one, one fixed point and two robot arms basically moving the other two points. Uh, these, these fabric forms were basically stitched from a uh, translation of the 3D model. And they pour, it's, it's not quite that simple. We had to go through a couple of iterations of what kind of reinforcing that we would put into this uh, into this uh, concrete, and uh, it's it's basically similar to a UH, or UHPC process uh, where you use glass fiber. You see the boneyard, all of the sitting. Um, that's it installed in Palm Springs, and eventually it was installed at the uh, A Plus D Museum in LA for for a little bit. For those of you who got a chance to see it, so um, successful process. I think that's where we're going. To be honest, um, I hope we get there sooner than later. Uh, but definitely, from our group and our and, and our firm, uh, we 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 push in terms of uh, philosophically, we push this this process. Uh, whether it's a simple building or or a really difficult building is really not the point. Point is, can you make uh, visual modeling and data be your be your main sort of uh, element that's used for design, used for engineering, used for fabrication and, and construction? And I think uh, we're getting there. Owners are starting to listen. They're starting to sort of see the benefits of it. Um, and actually, contractors are definitely see 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 the benefits of it. It's one way for architects to take back control. I think of the fabrication and construction process, the control that we've given up for the most part over the last 20 years, but uh, hopefully, you know, uh, it, it becomes a standard process. What's next? Collaborative team of teams, delivery informed process. That's uh, delivery for for construction, <laughs> high quality models right from up front, from from the design stages. Uh, we don't wait till CDs to really do that model. Uh, open software, Rhino, Revit, Tecla, it's all, it's all open, uh, open source. Uh, you have access to the APIs, which are, which are uh, now we get into, um, we are not, I mean, we don't want to be specialists. We want to be sort of the standard for the industry because we think there is, there is, there is benefit to that. And, you know, empower people to use their own tools. Uh, there's no, doesn't have to be one tool over the other. That's uh, that's our soapbox. Tip for today, in 25 minutes. I have a question regarding the last project. Was the funicular structure, which was all compression, or it was all compression? Yeah, it was it was it was form found. They uh, they took a shape, basically turned it around right. yeah. under uh, under uh, its own weight, formed the catenary. Mm -hmm. In terms of the CAD CAM process, that you know you have a model and you are going to just fit the data to the machine for fabrication. I know that you know these days you know a lot of people are using Grasshopper and Rhino versus Dynamo and Revit. Which way you found it, the process easier to fit the data, or is it just it doesn't matter? It's basically just it doesn't it's, matter it's, what is, yeah it's yeah. it's it, it's the set basically that. That is 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 the power in all of that data exchange, right? But in terms of design, it's all done in Rhino. I mean, that's that seems to be the most the software that everyone's comfortable in. Right. Um, Ten years ago, or fifteen years ago, it was Katia. Right? But Katia is way too expensive. Our team has basically managed to extract the processes that they used to use in Katia and we, and essentially use use Rhino. So the thinking is the same in terms of process. 
but uh, the software is cheaper and more accessible to to everybody. Uh, I mean, this was stuff that I mean, I mean, I, I I always say one of the biggest contributions of Gary is essentially you know this digital process more you know uh, kind of change the way we think about building. Uh, so, but you know, he has Katia and digital practice. Uh, but uh, Rhino is, is definitely the most powerful tool. Right. Right. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. I have a quick question. Um, um, there's one image where it shows like a Rhino surface and then it has like a zebra patterns and you say using that kind of image to inform you on uh, kind of make the panel more efficient. How does that zebra pattern, like how do you need that? What does that actually do? There's actually a plugin in Rhino that, that gives you surface uh, smoothness. Okay. It, was, it was a process of smoothing. So de depending on how you make your surfaces, right? You know, like uh, for for that particular pro project, the surface was uh, actually developed in Maya. So by the time you transfer it into Rhino, there's a lot of uh, loss in data. Okay. Uh, we were getting kinks and things. So you sort of do a zebra analysis to make sure that, that there there are no kinks and remodel it in in Rhino for okay. the most part. Yeah. Thank you. That was that process. Yeah. Otherwise, every kink will show up. In in the panel, right? The panel has to be perfect. You were uh, saying that you think the next steps are going to be going from kind of a digital model directly to fabrication. Um, I don't. It seems like it's not really architects or even consultant engineers that have an issue with that. It seems like it's either contractors, and you're saying fabricators are starting to get on board with mm -hmm. it. But it's also um, municipalities. Requiring 2D drawings. Have you ever run into a municipality that will accept a 3D model as a submittal? Unofficially. <laughs> um, I think the, the which project comes to mind. Uh, in my previous uh, firm, we did a we did a we did a public project with a train station, um, and basically the city said models are not contract documents. And the architect basically had their contract say so you have to publish drawings. We just published reams of reams and reams of data. I mean, basically work points, because that entire building was there were no dimensions on that building. It was all work points for for every component: facade, steel, secondary framing. Right? And eventually, the contractor told the city that we can't work like this. We need the model. So, um, I think if the team sits down and sees the benefit of it, the uh, the municipalities and the uh, they will they will see the benefit of it and work and uh, get a get a workaround. But eventually it will change. I mean uh, I think uh, uh, now I see in aviation projects which are also sort of publicly funded always have that 2D document set. Yeah, I mean warriors they had a 2D document set, right? So uh, but eventually the contract is if they demand it, the municipalities will change. Question is are owners willing to pay the design team to do it? Um, that's been my struggle because they don't want to pay up front because they're so used to paying the contractors for this work. Uh, they have a hard time saying the design team is going to do it. But uh, slowly, maybe that will change. Yeah. I think there's a big waste in the design process. <clears throat> I mean, the bottom line, you're still using points for the way needs of, of rebuilding the model in different for different uh, purposes right? yeah. so in a typical process you'll have four or five different models rebuilt for a specific type of performance mm -hmm. measurement or analysis uh, and this idea that you can only model once and have uh, the model react to the input of multiple uh, inputs or the multiple disciplines still a bit far ahead I haven't seen anything that does that that's ideally the the goal or have you seen anything that points we to used that? to yeah yeah we used to talk about the perfect model yeah <laughs> I, yeah I, I don't think there's any such thing yeah uh, because I mean you you don't want to it I mean one model doesn't fit a different software so you have to have different softwares you're going to have different platforms um, but the ability to have the interoperability is really what's what's powerful if we can achieve that in a really smooth fashion, you don't need to build one model. That's that's our current that's our current understanding. Are your consultants using or sorry, 
<laughs> your collaborators, are they using SID as well, or is that a completely in-house tool? It's in-house right now, but it's, I mean, it's no sort of, you know, it's, it's basically a CSV file, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure people are creating tools around that, uh, and we share the SID anyway, so with, with, the, with, the, with the teams that we're working with. So the architect needs the model, you just send them the SID. Uh, question is all I mean I mean all they have to do is extract the right right amount of information that's good for them. Yeah. Been successful so far. I mean since we are structural consultants for the for the most part, uh, the SIDS really around structural engineering and steel structures. That's where uh, it was developed for. Uh, we started using it for these other things. Uh, but really it's very powerful from the steel fabrication all the way through Tecla. Uh, because you can really put in forces even for the Tecla modeling. For detailing and um, um, but as as a as an idea, I think it's pretty it's pretty powerful. Still under development. I'm sure there were some issues that came up at the beginning of when you started to use SID, and I'm wondering what was the most unexpected issue that you guys came across. Um, I'm not sure. You'd have to talk to my team more. Like we're in the in the, in the day to day, um, sort of really working where where the pitfalls are. Um, from what I see is uh, from a slightly higher level is trying to transfer mostly into Revit, <coughs> where you have most of the uh, most of the errors. Things don't, you know, um, things overshoot uh, work points. But I'm, I'm, they don't meet the orientations are off. That kind of thing. Yeah, but then you have to go back and fix it. Over again, so it's that last transfer into Revit that's that's really been the issue in terms of documentation. So that 3D models and that solves that problem. Mm -hmm. So which phase of the project you're usually in? I'm sorry, sir. Which phase of the project you should be involved in? In schematic design? Should we be involved in? Yeah, every phase of the project. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think from conception um, to schematic is probably not the best. So, so it depends on the type of project. Right. Um, the con the complex projects earlier the better because you want to see the end game and work from the beginning to the end game. Right. On more standard projects, possibly around uh, towards the end of SD is uh, the most uh, beneficial, and then through through DD. Uh, and then uh, based on what the project is, do we go into CD? Well, depends. Uh, sometimes design assist contractors come on and pick up that role. Uh, but for complex projects, early is better because you want to work the process together with with the team, right? Say this is what we want to build. How do we start so that you know we can we can we can get there? Yeah. So on on the warriors, we were there right right from the beginning, right after concept. Um, at least for this particular phase, the earlier one was a different story. Right? Anybody else? Did you, uh, I have a question back. I'm curious, um, what sort of methodology you use, uh, you've experimented with in terms of automating iterations or optimization with uh, your you know, modeling work? We try and do as much automation as possible, um, obviously, because what it helps us do. So the Minnesota project is a really good example of that. Um, that process was what we call a series of recipes. That we created, and there were different workflows within each recipe, but each recipe was one type of task, right? Uh, like one was basically to take the information from the fabric analysis model, remodel it, run it, capture the data, and create the create the diagram again. The next one was, can you take that information and basically redo the hoops to where you know there's so that that level of recipe allows you that iterative process. So in terms of design phases, that's what I would sort of say the, the automation is, right? There's no automation of the whole process. It's, you know, who needs us, right? You just need the programmer. But sort of uh, compartmentalizing each process has been pretty effective for us. Say, you know, if I'm dealing with you and there's a process that we're going through, then I'll automate that process so that we can talk effectively. But with somebody else, maybe there's a different uh, different process. 
but eventually we're all going to the same thing. Makes sense? Thanks. Um, your your sort of format presentation was one point, two point, three point. I was curious if any of your processes start to consider data outside of geometry and adding that into the workflow if that's um, considering you know, the sun or, or the wind or any of those sort of integrations, solar glazing. I know that with the Chase Center it was very like, here's the structure, you have it onto the structure. Um, obviously, you know, adding those and putting those together takes a whole other, you know, sort of level of data, but is there any consideration to how you could start to bring that into the fold? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are people doing it. Uh, we don't do it as much in our group. Uh, yeah. I would say we've started working on something called a climate group, which basically, once it's completely formed, we'll, we'll do that on, on projects. Uh, we're working on the Ram Stadium in LA, and there was a lot of that done for that because that whole project is basically uh, uh, dug into the earth about 100 feet, and there was very little air movement. And, uh, a lot of, so what you're saying is basically had to be an iterative process of finding sort of the right comfort level at the field, and we didn't do that. RWDI did that work. But it was an iterative process, which could be powerful. I mean, if it was automated for sure. Yeah, I mean, you're, just, you're iterating structure right now, but iterating yeah. further. Yeah, further. you can do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to switch um, to our second presenter, um, who's going to present remotely. If there is more questions, we could just <coughs> right. stay and, uh, answer after the um, the second round of presentation. Um, so Nir Vixal, he's a PhD student at Georgia Tech. He um, does research in machine learning and how he can automate the design process using algorithms and um, space planning. So, uh, hello everyone. Can you can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay. So I'm Nirvik and uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Georgia Tech. Uh, my advisors are Dennis and John. I think John, John has already joined you. So I'll be presenting my research on space allocation. Uh, so actually the, this whole idea was uh, inspired by Dennis who shared who was my advisor and, and he shared that a deep insight that there should be a cloud of algorithms which are chained which have chain functionality, and and these and these efforts are, are sort of a result of translating these these two strong ideas uh, into computer programs, and uh, we hope that this research will have a direct application for architects and planners, and we can provide some solutions for layouts at uh, various scales. Uh, it is proposed that uh, in this research that uh, there are fundamental patterns in the way that spaces are laid out. So even if the geometry changes the operations on them are consistent and we can replicate them computationally uh, as well as uh, uh, we can perform well regardless of the scale uh, so the, so this is basically an uh, animation of the uh, design optimization tool set or, or the dots it's a rhino grass of a plugin uh, and it works on the basis of parameters of these patterns and parameters uh, that, that alter them so it is not a quantitative solution and it takes into account the fact that every design project and design sensibility is different. Uh, okay, so so what are the challenges? Uh, so okay, so first of all, what is space allocation? It is the process of locating geometric forms of spaces towards specific functions. Now these are these have to be constrained by appropriate grouping and circulation requirements, uh, and they they will end up. Uh, and result in the generation of floor plans for a building or an urban layout. Now, space allocation problem was uh, formally described as a quadratic assignment problem in 63, in 1963, uh, and uh, it was defined as, as a way to locate various facilities while minimizing the distance and cost related to flow supplies. Now, due to the combinatorial complexity of the problem, it is categorized as an NP-hard problem. This means that the the complete enumeration of layouts will increase at least exponentially with each increase in 
design requirements. And uh, just a few variations generated manually may not guarantee a suitable design option. So, so if you have just 14 spaces, then they will lead to 87 billion possibilities, right? Permutations. Uh, so if we consider prior research, there are four major approaches. The first approach starts with a tentative configuration, which is provided by the designer. And then based on discussions and exhaustive set of equations are developed, uh, then using these equations, we can plot, uh, I mean, the, the researchers plotted appropriate dimensions of the spaces. And this, this is a rectangle, a rectangle. Now, these methods are sensitive to input, to the input sketch, and even slight changes can really disrupt the solution. Okay, because of the, the way the equations work. Uh, although, although this is very simple, the method provides a deep insight, which is that uh, space allocation actually has two problems embedded in it. The first is a topologically ac accurate uh, solution, which is the initial sketch. And then it has to be solved for geometric constraints. Okay. So next we look at a graph theory based approach. So it, this, this actually approximates the initial sketch in the, in the previous slide. In this case, the layout is regarded as a directed graph with nodes as spaces and constraints as weight. So, that, so then definitely we have to uh, minimize the cost of graph traverse, traversing the nodes. Uh, alternatively, matching algorithms were proposed, uh, and the solution was transformed by taking the rectangular dual of a graph. Uh, and it, it is sort of inspired by circuit diagrams and VLSI layout planning. Uh, now, when I to space allocation, there were some problems uh, because of the, the three-dimensional nature of the uh, of the initial circuit graph, uh, and and they didn't respond well to the topological constraints. Uh, but it is but this graph theory uh, approach is important in terms of algorithms and data structures uh, because uh, contemporary algorithms are all based on on graphs and and how we can you now develop them. So the third. Uh, approach that I want to show is the cellular decomposition. It is achieved by discretization of a uh, enclosed region into geometric units or cells. Now the cells are grouped to form spaces that satisfy desired constraints. Uh, it, and this is a very flexible approach. So uh, we, can, we can throw many algorithms at this, including rule-based systems such as cellular automata or L systems. Uh, we can have uh, heuristics such as genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, and so on. But there's a problem with this with this technique. That is that it, it totally ignores the geometry of the layout. And the, uh, ultimately, the, the layouts, the architectural layouts will differ drastically uh, from the output, which is generated by these elaborate tessellation algorithms and their constraints. But the idea of decomposing the internal region uh, and, and, the, and the way the data structure of a cell uh, works is sort of similar to the graph-based approach, and, uh, and, and therefore it is, it is still relevant. So finally, uh, this is a more recent technique perhaps, uh, and it, it is inspired by an algorithm to visualize hierarchical information structures or the organization of data in a disk. Uh, by Johnson and Schneiderman in 91. So even though this method is restricted to rectangles, it generates floor plan like structures that are sufficiently realistic in the virtual environment for computer games. Yes. Uh, so while the aspect ratio can be controlled, the ability to generate rectangles with exact dimensions and, uh, and also the, the constraints of proximity and circulation, uh, that, that, uh, that was not demonstrated here. So there is some scope for uh, improvement, perhaps. Uh, first is we, we would like to handle diverse shapes that are found in architectural geometry. Then the non-trivial uh, shapes of architectural spaces, such as general curves and polygons, will introduce additional complexity to the system. And when we have heuristics that apply randomness to generate a layout, uh, and then they are evaluated by a predefined cost function, then definitely the the, uh, the the curves and polygons will will add a lot of complexity to these uh, to these stochastic systems. Okay. Uh, secondly, the the stochastic systems, are, I mean the heuristics, they don't have mechanisms to learn from the action taken. So so they blindly create a whole generation, and then uh, certain aspects of that generation are carried forward. So what what happens is that they fail to exploit the sequential structures of data or information, and overall it fails to scale. 
another problem is that over constrained problems. So a problems when they have more uh, more than one solution or un unrealistic set of requirements will cause problems. So this is noise, and noise will create problems in the in these kind of uh, situations. So also since the requirements vary drastically for every layout, defining the appropriate constraints as an input. Uh, to the optimization process. So setting up the whole equation system for a new project, this, these things will require a lot of expertise. Okay. So Nervic, can you take a, <clears throat> excuse me, take a breath for a minute. The audio is not ideal here. So I just want to kind of make sure folks have the big picture here, which is essentially Nervic's doing his PhD and has gone pretty deep into space planning. And it's basically just, um, told us that it's a very hard problem that becomes exponential very quickly. If you have 14 spaces to lay out, it becomes 8 billion possible ways to lay them out. So you've just gone through kind of 60 years of theory in terms of people who have taken different approaches, kind of grid-based approaches, tree, graph-based approaches. And he just sort of summarized what are some of the kind of major um, difficulties still with these kind of current approaches. and. Now he's going to try to present a solution to address them. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for, for saying it so nicely. Uh, so we would like to address the geometry, learning algorithms, and uh, scaling uh, to help develop the spatial allocation techniques. Uh, so first of all, we would like to provide the, simplify the access to software using spreadsheets and intuitive inputs to the system and provide solutions on a, on a proprietary software that is well known to designers. Then in terms of geometry, we would like to uh, extract typical architectural patterns of corridors and rooms and, and build upon that. So also we would like to develop uh, modular systems, so the cloud of algorithms and chain functionality. Uh, so that we can add new patterns uh, once they're developed and also uh, it's open source so hopefully there can be more uh, participation from the community so these these uh, modules can be used in conjunction and they would permit uh, multiple types of arrangements uh, leading to more realistic uh, layouts so in terms of optimization we would like to uh, propose that uh, uh, every single uh, a model free approach so this is called a model free prediction and uh, control system where every step taken by the algorithm is tracked in terms of the improvement to the layout. And uh, it is evaluated in terms of a numerical feedback signal, which indicates whether or not the move was beneficial. Okay, so the algorithm predicts a score and it has an error component. So over time, over the number of iterations, the error component is reduced. And, the, and, and we have a neural network, we use a neural network, uh, which will just predict the score. And because it is running in polynomial time, uh, it will save us. It will save a lot of computational uh, ex expenditure. Okay. Finally, the constraints are also internally scored, and if they don't perform well with respect to the layout, they will be discarded. So this this will allow all these problems around uh, uh, over constraints and, and noise in the system. So despite the seeming randomness of architectural shapes, there are certain patterns, uh, definitely. Uh, it is proposed that the geometry of architectural space, uh, of architectural patterns can be replicated, and we can use these primitive patterns uh, and, and combine them to produce the realistic layer. Okay? So based on the underlying algorithms and uh, the, the nature of architectural geometry, we started with two classifications. First is that spaces are generated along points on a given curve and they're bound by normals. Now, secondly, the spaces are also generated by recursively subdividing the internal region into parts and by exploiting <coughs> an equivalent relation between the list of area requirements and geometric operations that create the binary partition. Okay. Uh, so partitions of the internal boundary, uh, they can be used to, to separate the functional requirements of the floor plans. Uh, and we see this equivalence relation here, where we have uh, L, which is the set of uh, area requirements, and we have a side boundary. Let's say, let's say we have a boundary where the sum of the uh, re requirements is equal to the area of the uh, side. Then if we split or if we partition the L set 
set of requirements L, then we can definitely uh, de break down S, which is the shape, into two components. Uh, each of which component will exactly match uh, the two subdivisions of L, which is M, summation of M and N. And, and therefore, this gives a guarantee. Uh, so we, we can give a guarantee that definitely we have achieved the area. Okay. Then in terms of uh, matching this, uh, this topological optimization, so uh, the nearest neighbors, uh, the way we have to group the, uh, the spaces. Uh, so we use, we use this algorithm at an intermediate level uh, where, we, where from the geometry modules, we extract the array of locations and we also have the array of uh, requirements. Okay, so what we would do is we would match the indices of the layout of the uh, places in the layout and the space. So once we once we start matching it, we don't have to create the geometry, and this will again save computational time and it will help scale the algorithm. Okay, so so the design optimization toolset or dots is basically the Grasshopper plugin. Uh, and uh, we are proposing that there is this procedural uh, geometric transformations uh, which can be evaluated with logical arguments. And uh, primarily, there are two operations, which is subdivision and then placing the building or a spatial object in it. Okay. In addition to the floor plan modules that we have seen so far, a slight modification of them, of, of those modules, provides components for the site plan or urban planning. Uh, and there are, we have right now we have four mechanisms of generating the parcels. Uh, we can use the recursive subdivision. Uh, we can extend the segments of our internal polyline, uh, or else we can have uh, place a set of regions in the plane by an exploratory process. And finally, we place appropriate parcels along the periphery. Okay. So, so this slide shows how the grouping is achieved. It considers the area required number of types of spaces and favorable neighbors. So the Excel sheet captures the adjacency values. The positive uh, values denote attraction, whereas the negative values capture the repulsive force. And uh, the numerical value is the magnitude. So in this case, you can see that A and C should be together and E should be separated. So regardless of the geometry and regardless of the operation, we find that uh, the, the algorithm is, is actually able to uh, to solve the problem. Hey, Nervik? Yes, sir. I'm going to ask you to take a breath for a second again. Um, so he's just going into and explaining um, a series of open source grasshopper components. You guys already have uh, access to these and the uh, invitations, I believe. Um, and now go to the, the next slide, the one you were just on. And so he's now describing the inputs. And one is this matrix that you see up here on the right which are essentially a series of spaces, A, B, C, D, E, each of which have um, adjacency requirements to each other. So that 20 means you want C to be next to A, and the minus 100 means you want E, you want all E's to be as far apart from each other as possible. And then you see these little tiny colored icons, the purple circle, or sorry, the brownish colored circles in the brown square, the tiny ones, those are the little components that will take this information and then do different kind of optimization layouts. Just a quick question. So um, once Nerik was um, describing, so there is a kind of space planning along a curve. There are two steps from my understanding. And then the next one would be the composition of the layout of those spaces. So he would be able to take, let's say, this middle geometry and then say that, you know, this is a corridor. So that's the main curve, which is, you know, basically all the spaces, they are going to go along the curve. And then, like, the space in the middle is going to be able to also define some spaces in that void. Or... Yes, yes, absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. That's what, that's what the idea is, that we can chain these modules together so we can apply various kinds of... Uh, patterns, architectural patterns, one after another, sequentially, in conjunction. So like one input is that, that space matrix, and another is a boundary within which you want to try to place those spaces. So you can do that sort of sequentially to, and you know, create, create a curve created by one operation and then new spaces. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you can see that here. In the, in the third image, you do the outside, and then the fourth image is the inside of that space. 
Yep. Yes, exactly. Yep. Okay, so um, moving on. John, do you have do, do you want to say no, that's something? Good. I think you know. I just yeah. All right. Thanks, John. So uh, so finally, uh, this slide. I mean, we sh we saw how the grouping is achieved. Now now this slide shows these figures basically show the sample of possible boundaries and space allocation within them. They they demonstrate the idea that uh, of generalizing operations to all shapes. Uh, it's better than trying to generalize the geometry uh, so and and this helps in scaling of course and the inputs are provided by the excel sheet as you can see so so the adjacencies are, are the a versus a uh, and the area and numbers and ratios are, are the other set of uh, geometric uh, constraints that we impose upon the system so uh, so a, a little bit, so there's so much talk about machine learning and uh, so a little bit about the sort of machine learning and how, how it really works. Uh, so in order to organize these multiple objective functions, first uh, a, a model that represents various states or design variables are constructed. And instead of directly computing the cost of the edge weights, uh, discounted rewards are computed. Okay, so, so this will ensure that uh, there is no greedy optimization. So for, uh, so for example, if A and B produce a good solution, but C and A produce an even better solution, but uh, the algorithm finds B first, then it puts A and B together. So we, we would like to avoid that. So, so this is the local minima, global minima, that, that sort of a game. So in order to, we, we would avoid that with the uh, discounted reward function. So the table for cost, for the cost between any two uh, nodes, will provide a reference uh, to reach the goal from any any state. Okay, uh, so, so that's why this would be preferable to a blind stochastic uh, or heuristic algorithm. So this form of learning is, is basically known as Q-learning and it's commonly used in reinforcement learning. Uh, it, so reinforcement learning is the third type of machine learning. First is uh, supervised, then you have unsupervised. And then we have reinforcement, and there's a there's a very gap, big gap between the way reinforcement learning really works. Uh, so so this uh, this uh, okay. So we can say that the matrix is actually the transition matrix, and it constitutes the probabilities between states taken together. And if we take all the all the states taken together, then it forms a policy. And this policy, when if we maximize the policy it will determine the best path from all the nodes to reach the goal, okay? So here you can see the, a very simple example where in the environment, you can go to E and then it's a path, basically, the white lines. <coughs> can you see my cursor? I don't know. Yeah, we can. I, I suggest we move on though. I think um, right. okay. uh, we, there's, there's so learning the, going on. Yeah. Right. So, so we know that in space allocation problem, the MDPs have a very large number of states in action, and the efficient approach to use a, is to use a model-free approach where the effect of moving from one state to another is modeled. Uh, so there's an efficient learning method uh, which uses greedy algorithm, epsilon greedy algorithms to map spaces to states uh, or locations, and it maximizes the action value functions of the policy. Right. So first, a reward is predicted along with an error function for the states in that policy, then the discounted reward is calculated and the error is adjusted. So agent environment interaction is the is actually the exploration of states which updates the predicted value function and, these, and, and this is given by the feedback provided by the environment. Uh, another way of saying it would be to say that uh, the agent learns an optimal behavior for the policy uh, by minimizing the error and converging towards true value of the states. Okay. So finally, uh, right. So so now we get into the the way that neural networks can be used, and this is really important for scaling. So the space allocation is NP hard, but if we provide a candidate solution, then it can be evaluated in polynomial time. Okay. So then the, the action that is used for space allocation is actually the relocation of the spatial object, which is also the changing of the state. Okay, and, and then we measure the, uh, the effect on the layout by a feedback signal. And uh, 
in this case uh, it is given by proximity relations and access to cardinal direction these are the two primary measures uh, that that are calculated for the action on a space and its effect on the entire layout then the, the bottom leg is actually calculating the score each time each time we make an we, the agent takes an action so in order to scale the algorithm we will use a uh, function approximator which will provide a score for the action without calculating it so it should not calculate it we have to find some other way to do it basically predict it so for this we use the neural network and uh, in order to perform the supervised learning identical independent data is generated by performing an action calculating the score for a few thousand iterations which is sufficient to train the neural network and in effect the agent actually simulates data so we don't have original we don't have data from before because all design projects are different design sensibilities are different geographies all that so therefore we simulate the data and we train the neural network okay so so now in this we see the the way it is scaled up there are 52 spaces here and uh, the algorithm even though this is all javascript uh, It, the algorithm is able to achieve uh, around 15,000 iterations per minute, and each iteration has around 2,500 uh, uh, calculations. But you can see that it it hits the target very fast, uh, and we can change. So you can try this, and you can change the constraints and see that uh, it will it will give you the right patterns. Okay, uh, and and the scores will consistently improve. Uh, right. so we come to this idea that okay space allocation we have seen at a layout scale or a building scale but uh, actually the the cities and and urban planning uh, is is a very big uh, system where there are uh, networks and these networks interact with each other okay so so once these networks start interacting with each other there is a variation in fsr uh, distribution across these networks so so first task is to separate or group nodes of the network together and then distributing the fsr okay so here in green we have the green circulation network which is meant for pedestrian movement so this is typically think about it as residences or facilities which can be easily traversed on foot and this is connected by the green edges uh, rcn is a road circulation network which contains large commercial and office spaces which are used by people from outside the region and uh, there is heavy vehicular traffic and they are connected by the road edges ncn is the neutral circulation network which contains the modes for services and required activities such as healthcare and schools there may or may not be vehicular traffic on them and they are the layer between the gcn and rcn uh, which connect the pedestrian edges to the vehicular routes okay uh, evacuation is basically the uh, places for shelter in case of an emergency they have to be the the distance the evacuation has to be minimized finally we have mst which is a minimum spanning tree which basically has to connect all the nodes without with minimum intersection with each other okay so so the main assumptions that generate the routing are edges connecting gcn and rcn should be mutually exclusive if possible and in case they intersect it must be displayed so it must be noted then uh, ncn must avoid green and road edges while wherever it is possible and use the minimum cost finally uh, minimum spanning tree just connects everything and the evacuation is uh, the shortest route to all other nodes okay so the the illustrations demonstrate how the above mentioned uh, uh, design objectives can be can be achieved okay so just to sort of summarize there are two tools going on here one is called dots as these uh, and basically the same basic algorithms are underlying both of them but used in different ways and packaged up differently and this is about a sort of urban scale network optimization where there are various he's worked with various urban designers and there are, there are sort of different levels what he's showing here are these different networks of um of movement through the city that are necessary bikes cars emergency things like that and then the ways that you can then layer on top of it the generative system to look at different um, building constructions on top of it. Thanks so. There's a link that you, what you're seeing here being done is um, you can go and play with the, the tool yourself and understand kind of how the other What's the interface? Is, the interface? Yeah, so uh, this is all uh, interface is your browser 
so this is a web service actually and it's totally remote and it's because it's fear of cost it's also a bit slow i'm sorry about that uh, but uh, it's on the uh, it's on the web and uh, i think the link is shared i think uh, plugsweb at uh, dot heroku uh, dot com uh, so we'll share i mean if it is not shared it's there at the end i will share it with you and uh, we'll discuss the technologies towards the end I mean, the point here is right now is to to understand what are the concepts and uh, and computation required to solve these kind of problems, or even start thinking about these problems at uh, at scale. Okay. Uh, George, is there is there anything else you want to say? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then we that the, now the now we try to use this uh, these algorithms to uh, and apply it at a studio project at GT. So this is the Kyojima district in Tokyo. And from the GIS model, the geometry data was processed and sent to a remote database, which is the MLAB. Uh, and actually, proper data formats such as uh, IFC, City GML, uh, OBJ, or GLTF was avoided. So we used a very simple coordinate system and uh, normals, uh, and encoded the whole thing into a very simple JSON format. And this really reduced the overhead cost. Uh, finally, the, the the model was faithfully retrieved from the database by the web service, and it could be rendered on screen, and and it can be modified dynamically. Also, uh, various uh, aspects of the model may be queried uh, by simple uh, user interaction. Uh, also, it can be downloaded. Uh, once we generate everything, it can be downloaded into the in the OBG format and displayed on Rhino. Uh, so two, so now for this project, we are showing just two, two different models. The model on the left-hand side uses the building footprints and distributes FSR over the network. Uh, and the, it can be controlled by the, uh, by the GUI. Uh, the model on the right-hand side extracts the regions between the street and it applies a tessellation algorithm to the region. Then it decomposes it, which basically decomposes it into parcels and then buildings are placed on the parcel. Now the model can be controlled by various parameters such as for tessellation, uh, then centrality, dispersal of open space, uh, node types, clustering, uh, then uh, FSR distribution of the node types, uh, sending and retrieving to databases. Uh, then there is some concept of interoperability uh, about data exchange between Rhino, GIS, and, uh, and the web service. Okay. Um, so finally, we just I just want to summarize the whole thing. So space, space allocation is the process of designating spaces towards specific functions along with uh, an appropriate grouping and circulation to generate floor plans for a building or urban layer. Uh, it is a, it, we may consider it to be an objective in the practice of architecture and planning. And hopefully th there can be practical applications of this research. Uh, the, the generation of this floor plan or layout has eluded automation due to combinatorial complexity. Uh, and in this research, we have proposed some methods to generate uh, the plans based on characteristic patterns of uh, layouts. Uh, then we have applied the reinforcement learning methods to guide geometric operations that generate the components, uh, spatial components, and also ensure the topological optimization. At an urban scale, there are additional cons constraints in the form of interaction between networks. And finally, we, use, uh, we separate the networks and dispute FSR. Uh, along the nodes and edges once we have separated them and, and classified them all together. So, so DOTS was built uh, during the summer internship with John, who's also an advisor. And, uh, please feel free to provide feedback and comments. This is a work in progress and we are focused on research than actually uh, industry tool. And there, there are a lot of bugs. Uh, definitely we would like to address these issues and develop more modules. If you have any comments or feedback for me, uh, please feel free to email me in case and in case you would like to see some features probably we can we can uh, integrate uh, join our efforts thank you thank you questions So, uh, John, this is a. There's going to be a test on this. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all this is an attempt to uh, uh, decipher the formula of traditionally intuition, of, the intuition of, of, of architecture, or the unspoken rules of architecture. Um, 
they are um, successful to a certain extent. But the whole notion that a computer might sometime do um, this for us, uh, how far are we from there? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I don't know if anybody was here um, or remembers when, when this was Doug, SF Doug. Um, we had a um, another student named Subhiji Das present something called Space Plan Generator, which was like a, two years ago. Two years ago. Um, and, you know, this is sort of learning from that and going to the next level. And um, I mean, I think what uh, what's exciting about Nervix work is, you know, with space plan generator, somehow it just what it, it was really interesting and it would sort of ins it would somehow inspire some designers a bit to maybe think about the project a little differently and just to kind of generate a bunch of stuff. We could never kind of um, Im Im embed all of the, the sort of unique logic of the designer in a way that we just couldn't, you know, we weren't getting there with space plan generator. So Nervic is sort of you know, it, it seems to me taking a real step back into the some real fundamentals, and the, particularly with this idea of dots. Um, you know, there are these components that encourage you guys to try them, where you start to move them out into these different workflows, and you may lay out four or five or six different sort of sequences of dots, which kind of describe a slightly different design logic. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, explore different. Uh, uh, locations for how the street can enter the site, but I'm going to fix this part to always be in this location. And that could be like one design sort of part T, and then another one might kind of invert it and say, I'm going to keep the streets, you know, uh, static, but explore where the park might go or something. And so you can start to kind of iteratively define this sort of logic and then work with the computer um, to, to explore different alternatives. And it's um, the, one of the real surprises for me in this research was kind of tight integration of optimization with the generation. Um, I still haven't fully got my head around what he's doing there. But like, you know, usually you know, a space plan generator or something, you, you generate a space plan and then you create a whole bunch of analyses of it. And then you, you know, store that data and then you go iterate. And, and he's able to sort of um, more incrementally optimize and optimize different pieces of the design um, in a much smarter way that, you know, is, is again, kind of talking about this kind of interaction with the designer in a, in a new way, which is kind of trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. Break it in pieces and optimize the individual, tackle individual uh, areas based on the choices that the designer Tell the computer to do or like yeah it's sort of like how how do you the, the problem is like even you know see shows like it, it's ex, it's exponentially complicated very very quickly and so it's it's kind of too large to explore the whole thing so, which is always the case and so we have this great like innate ability to to, um, to sort of decompose the problem and intuit like smart locations to start and um, this, this, I guess, is just a different way of, different set of tools for breaking down the problem. You still have to have that kind of intuition. Like, you know, here's how I'm going to approach the problem, break it into these pieces. And this, you know, I'm going to optimize for these criteria first. Uh, uh, I'm actually curious, I'm, and I'm sorry if I missed this uh, when I stepped out, but um, was there a layer of uh, upcodes or something that's connected to City codes and uh, automatically embeds the zoning criteria and all that stuff. So, Nervic, do you um, hear the question? Maybe. Uh, yeah. So, city codes. Uh, we we did a project uh, previously with John and uh, John and Siren, and uh, there we had this whole idea of city codes. Uh, so here, actually, what we have in uh, in dots is a whole bunch of FSR and. Uh, uh, on these requirements that you can uh, directly manipulate with sliders and boolean functions uh, it, it is also possible to feed in these this information from a uh, from a extra from a file outside i don't know if you, if you can see my screen you can see that uh, 
we have all these things uh, floor space ratio maximum height minimum area open space requirement setback step back so all, all these are are uh, basically procedural constraints they they're not that tricky so they, they don't contribute to the complexity of the problem as such so they can be generated while we generate the geometry at the last step then at that point we can incorporate this these kind of objectives uh, so that's why we have included them in the procedural uh, geometric construction constraints so definitely city codes as you asked yes definitely we have done some and there is a lot of scope uh, this is just work in progress it is a proof of concept to get the phd and uh, We'll see how far it goes. Thanks, Mark. Did you question? Yeah. Like, no, not specific codes, but sort of. But, but it sounds like you have to still like kind of manually enter in like the setback and the maximum height. Yeah, we don't have this uh, download Toronto city code and yeah. all that. But there's there's the yeah, of code. Of up codes is the only one. But there's from oh, that's I wonder if you got, if like if this is able to connect to it and. Kind of collaborate in that way. I don't know. Open source and online, go tell us. How long has this research been going on for for this particular? So, Nordic, the question was how long um, have you been doing this? Uh, I think 2016 spring. So, uh, now it's 2019 fall, so it's uh, two and a half years, so almost 2.75 years, I, I would say. So you, you came to Georgia Tech um, kind of already running, and you'd already been doing a lot of generative stuff running in 2016. Yeah. And, and what's the background in terms of your studies before coming to Georgia Tech? Computer science or architecture? Like how, how did you came to know that? There's so much information, and uh, I'm just curious, what, what, what did you study to get you to this? So I went to art school before coming to Georgia Tech, uh, and I got really frustrated because uh, it nothing nothing seemed to make sense. The theory was uh, so the theory that I studied in school was uh, truths of nature, and then in art school I found that. Uh, uh, the, the theory of architecture and, and art seem to be uh, opinions, more opinion oriented, uh, and and that's when uh, this whole idea that uh, of generative components, I think around 2010, that there was so much Zahadi uh, became very famous uh, with all the coding and uh, mail script. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but there used to be mail script uh, back then, which was very popular. And, and there was a lot of exploration based on that. So there, there were these uh, really amazing CAD professor uh, at, at uh, uh, Glasgow School of Art, uh, Professor Hannah Reid. And uh, he sort of, uh, and, uh, and then Grasshopper came out at that point. Grasshopper and Processing also came out at that time. And, and then he sort of pushed us in that direction that uh, there's something happening in CAD. You guys should really focus on that. And some of that, that, that sort of view. Uh, but the, but the background is art, more art than actual computer science. But he's in a, a program now at Georgia Tech, which um, uh, I'm not going to say it's the only one, but it's a, definitely a good one in terms of the application of uh, computational modeling to the built environments. Run, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, group called Digital Building Lab um, run out of the College of Design that integrates like lots of different departments at Georgia Tech, a lot of computer science students. So they do, they do a lot of this kind of research. Thank you. Are there any parallels to the work that's been done from WeWork, you know, on the dot section in terms of interior? I know that there's been a lot of yeah. optimization processes being, being done over there. So. Yeah, I, I think, I'm going to speculate. Um, I know like Daniel Davis and some of the other folks. That, and, um, Nervic laid out this kind of uh, um, history of space planning of 60 years, if you remember that. And one of them was this kind of grid-based optimization approach where you can like put stuff in different parts of the grid and then run an optimization loop on top of that. <coughs> My guess is they would do a lot of that stuff for their like workplace planning. Does they have those specific modules? That yeah, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that.
All right. Thank you very much, Nervi. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.